built after since the TIP was created, all that added tax value is going to help pay off the bonds that we bought for using to pay for the tunnel and some of the other improvements. But, and uh, none, of, none of the trail improvements. None of the trail improvements guys, are funded. So yeah. we're still up and free. Yeah. 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 we got to find the money to do a lot of what we want to do. See, we might be asking you to vote in a bond election. Yeah. Or there something be, like that. Yeah, pro likely there will be a, a future bond election. We had improvements for Palm Park on for the last bond election. And, you know, it came before the Parks Board. I was in the Parks Board. I looked at it and like, look, we really should just, we had to take something off the bond election. I said, let's take these off because we know we're doing Wall Creek. And we need to put them back on for that. So we, we've got stuff we know we need to do in the funds for bond elections, whenever that would be. Is that, we've got that two, new, two potential elections, one in 2010, which would be transportation based. In the planning, are you trying to encourage commercial along here, like coffee shops and things like that? Some, and that's what we should talk about too, because as another effort too, as part of the downtown Austin plan, we're doing a master plan for parks and open spaces. And, you know, downtown parks have typically not been funded by Parks and Recreation Department. They get proceeds from different kinds of user fees. The really vibrant urban downtown parks, a la Bryant Park in New York or Millennium Park. So we're looking at different kinds of funding mechanisms. We're looking at bringing in concessions into the parks, inexpensive food, restaurants, coffee shops, actually on park land that can bring activity to the park. The problem with this park and Palm Park, nobody's here during the day. There isn't a level of activity generated. You know, yeah. Well, you know what the kind of activity. There is. Well, it's, and it's a, it really presents an interesting challenge. This is not really a very natural, historic park. This this park actually was a, 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 a very mixed-income, urban, densely populated urban neighborhood up until urban renewal in the 60s and 70s. There was a lot of poverty. But it was, when I say mixed, I mean very mixed. But there was a, a real. There was a lot of very rundown housing. Uh, it was uh, it was actually very integrated. But it was viewed there, there was there were concerns about urban blight and so on. So urban renewal took care of all that. This just wiped it clean. You can still see the the old urban infrastructure here. If you go up to 14th Street, you can still see the old car bridge that went across 14th Street, which un until that time was a regular. I mean, you had an actual urban functioning grid, and now it's all. You know, they said, oh well, let's plunk down a park, and everything will be great. Well. Urban parks don't are, are kind of a tricky thing. You can't just plunk down urban space, green space in an urban area and necessarily expect it to work very well. You really need to surround it with a healthy mix of uses. And so what you see here, I mean, the mixes, we, the uses that we've got here are these lovely parking garages to, to the west. And then we do have a, a hospital, our, our, which we're very proud of, to the east, but it's not really the sort of thing that you normally stroll to on a Saturday night in order to have a cup of coffee or something. It's not really... There's not a lot of uses around here that would uh, normally bring activity to the park, and that's what makes a park kind of a, a, an abandoned, depressing sort of thing. Where I mean, look around right now on this Saturday morning, out in this love, in our biggest downtown park. Look at all the families and children playing and enjoying the park. It's just not work functioning very well, and so we really need to think hard about what we can do to change that. And it, it, it's going to require thinking about uh, different commercial uses, different concessions. When you have a big pond out here, would it help to like uh, have little uh, boats in the water that you could rent? I mean, little little uses like that. You really have to put a lot of thought into creating an active, appealing urban space. You know, the Congress for New Urbanism recently had a big conference on how to create successful open spaces, and I think we really need to engage in that kind of discussion and think creatively about the kind of inviting uses that would draw people here. Because it's a because if we don't if we don't succeed at that, that really could, could spell trouble for the whole Waller Creek project because this is not going to be the sort of area that, that pulls you in. You really need to, to come up with something cool and inviting and creative that's going to make you want to be here. And we've got a lot, 
long way to go on that. Hey Chris, with regards to the Waller Creek as a district, have we had any outreach or any participation from Brackenridge and or the on one side, you know, on the east, and then the state on the west? You know, I, I haven't seen much. I, I mean, not, I don't haven't seen much from either, really. Uh, no, I mean, the state's always hard to talk with. <laughs> <laughs> we do? Here, Tom's over here. The state's really interested in working with us on that and redeveloping all this area over here. It's still a little bit preliminary because there's so many state agencies and leadership and legislature and all those things. So we're very interested in working with you, particularly on these garages. And all yeah. Properties. Well, and control all these property along the And I think if, if we get, we're getting our, our, um, our urban circulator in, you know, the current plan is to go right up San Jacinto. So I think that could really rev up the discussion about what we're going to do with, with this with this northeast quadrant of, of downtown because uh, there is some huge potential. If you get if you get an urban circulator in there, could you possibly come up with some more fitting use than a, than a bunch of parking garages to, for that rail to go by? And so I think uh, uh, it'd be worth having that kind of... You know, San Jacinto used to be a really thriving thing. If you pick up that book, uh, Writing Off of Lives, that's put out, of, you can get it at the Austin History Center. It's a collection of stories written by Austinites. There's a chapter in there called Life on San Jacinto. Somebody talking about growing up on San Jacinto and how they used to love walking out to all the pleasant shops and restaurants and things. And, and it's a little hard to envision that today. But, it, but you know, it wasn't that long ago when it really did function well. And if we get a streetcar in again, then maybe we can get back to that sort of thing. And that would really make a huge difference for this for this park and this whole uh, part of downtown. And okay. something else is being talked about you know, relative to that, too, is uh, you, you're looking to bring a medical school to Austin. You know, the some of the locations they're talking about are right here uh, in this area. But one is just across 15th Street uh, in the, the field that's between here and the parking lot and the tennis courts for UT. Uh, and also, I think you're looking at some of the lots across from Brackenridge. So that could bring some activity in here. 